Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. I'm your host, Andrew Jelina. I am here this week with Ben Seckley. He is a founding team member, SVP, and head of field operations at Cambridge Semantics. Welcome, Ben. Good morning, Andrew. Nice to be here. Thank you for making it out on what's always a tough commute on Friday. Yeah, not bad. You know, I'm a local here in Needham, so very easy after a good haircut and Anthony's to come and visit with you for a bit before heading into town. Oh, I hope Anthony's is paying you for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one question we often ask up front is, you know, what's your origin story? What got you excited about technology way back in the day? Two things, I think. One was my grandfather on my father's side was actually an inventor. He had some very early patents in, for things like inhalers and was always into technology and toys and gadgets and kind of visiting his and my grandmother's apartment in Rochester, New York. There was always all kinds of recording devices and electric pianos. This was back in the early 80s when most kids weren't exposed to this stuff. And when he died, I got to take a lot of that stuff back home where I grew up in Ithaca, New York, and really get to play with it. And then I kind of launched into, of course, our first computer around the same time. And then with computers come games. And nowadays, I don't think kids really appreciate the fact that with any computer or gaming system, any game just works at high speed and it's not a problem. Back in the day to get computer games to work, you had to configure the memory and the sound card and every computer was underpowered for the latest computer game. So the original kind of debugging skills and figuring out how to make stuff work really started with trying to figure out how to get that stuff working. And that kind of launched into sort of an interest in making things work and systems thinking that really you know, grew into an interest in computer science and building software. Right. So after college, I think you went to work for IBM? I did. I was very fortunate actually during college to be part of an internship program at IBM. This was in 2000, back when at the time, you know, there wasn't Google yet really. And the big tech companies at the time, you know, Oracle and Microsoft were offering the internships that were very exciting. And so IBM trying to compete with them for students from good schools came up with a program called Extreme Blue. It was actually started by one of my co-founders here at Cambridge Semantics. And I went to do that with him my sophomore year in college. And it was just a really great experience getting exposed to kind of the latest technologies in, in computing and internet technology and web services and application servers. A lot of the things that his group had done when they built the first systems for the Atlanta Olympics and Sydney Olympics and U.S. Open, I got to dive into an internship really focused on all the technologies that were in the mix there. And so that group was just spectacular to work for, and it was a natural thing to do once I graduated from Cornell a couple of years later. Right on. And then after that, went to Cambridge Semantics, not to be confused with Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Two completely different companies with totally different missions. Certainly there's one person at every trade show who thinks they're being fairly unique when they come up to us and joke and ask us if we're Cambridge Analytica, and of course we are not. But yeah, Cambridge Semantics, we, we started that in 2007 after working in a space called Semantic Technology. And many folks aren't familiar with, with what that is. But around 2001, 2002, Tim Berners-Lee, after making the World Wide Web obviously incredibly successful at the time, thought that there was a next step in terms of making the World Wide Web more machine readable, you know, describing the content with machine readable tags but also in, in ways that humans could understand things better. And so he gave rise to a whole new set of standards called semantic web or semantic technologies. And what Sean Martin, a mentor and co-founders from IBM, uh, we recognize is that these technologies had a lot of applicability for integrating enterprise data, dealing with the real complexities of integrating, blending, and making data available from across very complex data ecosystems in the enterprise space. And so for several years at IBM, we did a number of kind of prototypes and open source projects in this space of semantic technology, really building on Sean and our team's middleware heritage to build these scalable platforms. But in 2007, it became clear that doing this as an independent entity was going to lead to the most success and fastest growth. And so in 2007, we started Cambridge Semantics to really prosecute the notion of using semantic technologies to effectively integrate data and make it available to people in ways that weren't possible before. So you built the Anzo platform, and how do I know I need the Anzo platform? What are kind of drivers, or what do you guys see in a prospect company where, oh, this is a slam dunk, you guys need to use this? Yeah, it's a great question. So all our customers who come to us all have unique challenges around data, but the common thread is that they have many sources of complex data that they want to integrate together, whether it's blending, unifying, organizing it in a certain fashion. Examples would be financial services companies looking to integrate all of their trading data and 
user communication data to try to track down fraud more effectively, or healthcare companies trying to integrate lots of clinical data together coming from lots of sources from many types of patients from around the world and integrating that more effectively. Technologies based on relational databases struggle to keep up with the speed, scale, and flexibility that's required for that data complexity. And so those customers look to Anzo because we have an ability to integrate the data much more quickly at much larger scale, dealing with complexity and change more effectively than other approaches. And the reason for that is the underlying semantic and graph database technology that sits underneath our platform. The semantics and graph is really the how we do what we do. And suffice it to say that graph is a way of organizing data that lends itself to how humans think and how humans think about the relationships and data that's far different than how relational databases work. And so is the end product like something that helps you visualize it or it's similar to like a machine learning or AI or big data where you're crunching it down and then doing some visualization or? Yeah, the end product is a platform that our customer, our large Fortune 1000 customers, although we do have some very exciting small growing companies that we work with as well, install generally in their cloud environments and they use it to sit on top of their existing databases and data infrastructure to give them a much richer experience integrating, working with their data. So one of the best things about our product is that you don't really need to throw out your existing data infrastructure, your cloud investments, your databases, it sits as an overlay to help you get a lot more value from your existing investments. Okay. So what are some of the insights that they might gain? Sure. So an example insight, generically speaking, might be something like looking at data from one clinical study tells you what you need to know to move that study forward to submission. But, you know, companies, the large top 10 pharma across the world globally, they want to mine all of their clinical data to get new insights to let them find new ways to repurpose their drugs. And so if you look at how patients globally responded to three or four different medicines over a period of time, you can get a new insight into how a new set of patients might respond to the same medication. So it really allow you to short circuit large amounts of research and development by simply using your data. And in fact, in the healthcare space, that is really where the push is right now. It's all about data. You see Apple and Amazon and Google all trying to collect as much data about people as they can. And you can see they all have these kind of shadow, in some cases not so shadow, healthcare business units starting to crop up. And the large pharma companies who are the big players in healthcare, of course, are a little bit frightened of that. And so they're trying to compete with data as well. And so it's a great opportunity for companies like us that have technology that can really help them compete on that stage with the big tech giants. So as far as the data fabric and graph, like what are the trends that are driving growth in this area? And where do you see it headed? That's a great question. So big data obviously is a topic that people understand generally what that means. When Google and Yahoo, right in the early 2000s, started to open source and make available some of the technologies like Hadoop and MapReduce, right, that they were using under the covers of their search engines and their ad systems, make those available for people to use, people started to get really, really excited that, oh, all this great technology that's being used for this web scale data I can now use in the enterprise. And that had a lot of challenges associated with it. Those technologies were really designed for homogeneous data sets to do very simple but large-scale operations like searching across a bunch of documents. What enterprises, big companies have found over the years trying to apply those things is that they don't have quite the same impact that they had for Google and Yahoo in the search space. And they've also found that one of the key objectives of modern data management, certainly in the last few years, is this need to connect information across the business, not solving one use case at a time, but really integrating, blending, harmonizing, and connecting data in a rich way than was ever done before. And that's the trend that's really driving our technology and our growth as a company. And there's an emerging data architecture called the enterprise data fabric, which is a way of reimagining data that instead of sort of looking at one use case at a time, it's thinking about data strategically, holistically across the business. How is data related together? How can you make it findable, integratable, and usable by many people? And so research firms like Gartner and Forrester are beginning to speak about the data fabric, although our founding PowerPoint decks talked about information and data fabrics uh, you know, over, over 10 years ago. But it's now a trend that's becoming much more mainstream, and it's causing a lot of interest in Cambridge Semantics and our products as a result. And graph technology, the data model that underpins the enterprise data fabric, allows for the data to actually be connected together. And we have just ourselves as a company, a lot of technology and experience that gives us a leg up in that space for sure. 
So tell me a bit more about graph technology, if you could, especially with relation to healthcare. What is kind of the human data model and how is that pushing things forward? Most people are familiar with the concept of a relational database. And if you're not familiar with the relational database, almost everybody has used Excel. And those technologies arrange data in rows and columns with a data point sitting in each cell. And that's very convenient for machines. They know how to deal well with rows and columns. And humans, technical ones, can look at that and make sense of it. But if you had 50 spreadsheets that were all talking about different concepts, it gets very difficult to manage and think about the relationships between data points and the relationships between concepts across those different spreadsheets. And the same thing is true of databases as you get into the scale of data in a large enterprise. Graph technology kind of cuts right to the core of that problem. It uses a fundamental capability to mine relationships, to represent relationships, and allow humans to participate in the process in ways that other data models don't. And so when you think about healthcare in human-centric data, one is the data is about humans, right? Humans are all different. We have different properties. We're changing. We have different relationships. And so the graph data model really lends itself to capturing patient and human data. But it's also a data model that humans can readily understand and interact with easily. So Ben, can you tell us a bit about maybe a real world story where you took that technology and brought it to life? Sure, absolutely. In our line of business of enterprise software, one of the sometimes painful but often exciting parts of the of the sales process is the bake off. If anyone's watched the show Silicon Valley, they have an episode with a bake off that hit pretty close to home in a lot of ways, but the idea of a bake off is that when customers are buying expensive software products or looking to build a solution, they don't just often pick one and go with it, they'll invite a handful of vendors in to come and try to solve a problem, often with very different solutions. The good ones do it that way, at least. And they see which one they like the best or cost the least or whatever decision criteria they're looking for, and they select it, and that's the bake-off. We do those all the time. Some we win, some we lose. That's just how it goes. But one in particular was very foundational in terms of our bringing the graph capability to light within the healthcare and patient data space one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, was looking to build a clinical data repository to integrate clinical data, to be able to ask questions across clinical trials. And this had never really been done before on a large scale. Of course, they do here and there with some one-off activities, but they had never really been done holistically. And so they invited a handful of their existing and new vendors in to try it out. And they gave each vendor data from three different clinical studies and said, all right, here's five questions. Show us how you can do it. Long story short, we were able to integrate all the data in just one week and were able to answer not only the five questions that were provided by the client, but any other question that they had was able to be dynamically asked and answered. And that was all because of the flexibility and speed of the graph technology. Frankly, we, we had no idea just how effective it was going to be. We hadn't actually tried that particular use case before. And I think we and the customer were pretty amazed just by how powerful graph technology was when applied to that sort of complex data in the face of unanticipated questions and new use cases that you want to try on top of it. All right. As an aside, Silicon Valley, one of my favorite shows on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite episode? Uh, I mean, that's that Bake Off one that kind of sticks out to me. Yep. The middle out compression one. <laughs> it's one that made me yeah. laugh really hard. And when I watched that show, I don't know if Mike Judge just hired writers that have actually had to do time in the software he industry. Had to have. I mean, there's no way you would know all that stuff without it. It's just so spot on. All the little personalities, all the little situations they get themselves into, the near acquisitions that then fall apart, yep. and, then, and then everyone's left wondering what to do next. Yeah, that's a great one. What's your favorite character from there? Oh, man, that's tough. I mean, it's just the interaction of Gilfoyle and Nagesh. <laughs> <laughs> the frenemies. I mean, we don't have a Gilfoyle and a Nagesh at Cambridge Semantics, but we have lots of Gilfoyle and Nagesh moments <laughs> that happen across the company on a fairly consistent basis. Yeah, either them or T.J. Miller's character there from the early Oh, pieces. that's true. He's, he's spectacular. He is. My dad told me never to talk to strangers or to recruiters, or to strange recruiters. It's so exciting when the website gives zero information about the job I am applying for. You take one three-month sabbatical, and all of a sudden, you're unhirable. You're not allowed to say it, but you're looking for someone younger than me. Joke's on you. I'm 11 years old. 
Finding your next consulting gig should not be this difficult. Quite frankly, you deserve better. Syrinx is the consulting company founded and run by software consultants. We get you. Find out why our employees are some of the happiest and best paid consultants in the industry at Syrinx.com. That's S-Y-R-I-N-X.com. Find a better way today. Syrinx Consulting is a proud sponsor of Underserve, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. So when you're not hands-on keyboard or making things move at Cambridge Semantics, what do you do for fun? Yeah, in recent years, it's been heading home from the office or from business travel as quickly as possible to spend time with my family, three small boys here in Needham. But one of the things we really like to do together is get out in the mountains and ski. And we like to go to the beach on Cape Cod in the summer. We like to do a lot of kiteboarding. And you know, skiing and kiteboarding have really been kind of a very common set of activities across many members of Cambridge Semantics. In fact, when we first started Cambridge Semantics, one of the things I had always wanted to do was do that ski bum winter um, somewhere out west. And it's something I kind of deferred when a number of my fraternity brothers went out to Lake Tahoe and I went off to IBM. I was a little bit of not regret, but certainly a feeling of missing out when that happened. So when we started Cambridge Semantics and every couple of our co-founders were going to be in Australia and another one in Texas and basically everyone kind of working from home as we just built the first generations of the product. So another buddy of mine in the company who is an avid snowboarder thought, hey, let's go and spend that first winter out in Utah. We'll work super hard when it's not snowing and when there are powder days, we'll get out and ski. And I would say that was kind of the turning point for me in terms of opening my eyes to what was possible in the mountains in terms of getting out in the backcountry and snowcat skiing and heli skiing and ski touring. And it's something that I still enjoy doing a lot right now. Don't get to go out as often now, but it's still a big part of my life and certainly enjoy sharing that with my kids as well. That's cool. Where did you go uh, heli skiing back in the day? Where did I go heli skiing back in the day? So the first heli skiing trip I did was to a place called Girdwood, Alaska, which is just outside of Anchorage. And Alaska is kind of the mecca of heli skiing. You know, they've got big mountains and a maritime snowpack that allows you to ski steeper lines with less avalanche danger. It was actually kind of cool. Right around 2011 is when I went and GoPros were starting to become popular at the time. And it just happened that the year I decided to kind of pull the trigger on the big heli trip, the heli operation was running a promotion where, hey, if you film your trip on a GoPro and send us a video, we'll pick the best one and give the winner over the whole season a uh, free trip to visit us again next year. And a lot of things aligned, long story short, ended up winning that and getting to go back and doing a free heli trip with a couple of friends the next year. It had just gotten into doing GoPros. And so two things happened. One is I had a lot of patience to go and actually edit the video and spend time doing it. But the year that I went out, the week that I got to go was actually the best week of sunshine and snow that they'd had all year. So I think I had some advantages in terms of the footage I came back with. But anyway, that was sort of a fun experience, though I certainly overdosed on video editing. So I haven't done much of it since. Well, I've, I've been getting into a little bit of that myself. Yeah. We're doing some video promos for the podcast. Yeah. So yeah. I started out with Camtasia and now doing like some Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a certain Zen to video editing. It feels kind of like coding when you're getting things exactly mm -hmm. right and you get it the way you want it and the music lines up and it's perfect. Like I could see how similar folks would be into that. Well, I think one of the things that once you get a GoPro, you take a bunch of footage and you start to edit it, you realize what the big problem with GoPro is, is that you come back from a week-long ski trip with six days times six hours of footage, and now you got to scrub through. All of it kind of looks the same. It's either white out if it's a snowstorm or it's all blue sky and snow if it's not. And trying to find those moments where you really did something interesting on the mountain versus just ski down a run or you caught a nice... 15 second clip of your friend in front of you doing something cool. And so spending the time to kind of find all that and fitting it to the music takes a bit of investment. Yeah. And the other thing I've been learning about is getting what they call B-roll. So mm -hmm. there's the primary action of you skiing and jumping and you know, riding three feet of powder and doing whatever. And then there's just kind of the like framing shots, like kind of a hand zoom or like a hand pan doing something. Yep. Or maybe you're even eating lunch or like a little intro to each of the people and so I've been trying to get more filmic and cinematic with learning how to edit things yep. together, especially because no one has any attention span anymore. You, no, <laughs> you got about eight seconds. <laughs> you got to make it interesting, keep it interesting. 
Yeah, the story you told about going out west reminds me of when I was a freshman in college. My first semester, I didn't do so great. My parents, as a, a carrot, said, all right, if you can make Dean's List next semester, we'll send you to snowboard camp. So it was out in British Columbia at Whistler on oh. the glacier in the summer. And I got to go out. Which camp was that? It was Craig Kelly back when he was alive. Mm. Um, Craig ran a camp and you know, you'd stay in the village and it was, you know, like summer down there. Mm -hmm. And you'd take a quad lift up and then another quad lift up and then a bus around to the back of the mountain. And then a, finally another lift up to the top. And then you'd ride the glacier all day and they had a half pipe carved out and bump run on the horseman glacier right on black yeah. home. Yep. Right. And then we did hike out of bounds to the wind lip and did get to go off of there. And Damian Sanders was there too. He was a big snowboarder back in the nineties. And I, I never forget seeing him do a double backflip off that wind lip. I was just like, Holy mm -hmm. cow. I did go off it, but I didn't do any double backflips. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a good story. I'd actually always wanted to do one of those summer freestyle skiing camps out in the glaciers in Whistler, but I could never justify using one of my ski weeks during the summer. Fortunately, they did start to do some freestyle camps in Lake Tahoe during the winter time, which I did a couple of times with some friends. And that was really fun. Although I think we were a little bit too old in our late twenties when we did it, because we had to take about four Advil every two hours to keep the shin bang under control. But we had a lot of fun anyway. My, my sister lives out in Tahoe with her husband, and they are doing similar to the story you were talking about. Like, when you need to work, you work. When it's powder days, game off. That's awesome. All right, so kiteboarding, like, I don't know much about it. I saw people doing it way back in my honeymoon, thought it was cool, but I've gotten a little heavier, slower, and have less time from having, mm -hmm. having kids at work and everything. What's, what got you into it? So I grew up in upstate New York in a town called Ithaca on Cuga Lake, and I was really into windsurfing when I lived there. When I moved to Boston, I wanted to get back into windsurfing in some fashion, but one, the gear was super expensive and really big and hard to transport. And kite surfing around 2002, 2003 was really just becoming more mainstream. And the one thing that attracted me to it before I knew a lot about it was that the gear was less expensive and a lot smaller. You could keep it in an apartment. You could throw it in the back of a small Subaru and get to the beach and go. And so that's what I did. And for those that don't know what kiteboarding is, you have a kite that's attached to a harness on your waist and you control it with your arms. And you have a small board that looks kind of like a snowboard or a wakeboard that allows you to ride on top of the water. And if you know how to maneuver the kite properly, you can use the jump up in the air. And that's probably what most people associate with kiteboarding when they see it. One of the biggest myths about kiteboarding is that it requires a lot of upper body strength and is hard to do. Certainly the first couple of lessons, you drink a lot of salt water and you might end up on the beach if you're not careful. But once you kind of figure it out, it's actually one of the more relaxing sports. It's very body weight neutral. The kite's holding you up by your waist and it's very light on your arms, light on your legs. And so people of all ages can go out on the water and kiteboard for hours at a time. If you go down to some of the iconic beaches on Cape Cod, like Chapin Beach on the Bay Side or West Dennis Beach on the South Side on a windy day in the early fall or in the summertime, you'll see dozens of kiteboarders out for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, when I saw them on our honeymoon, we, had, we did a split honeymoon between Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, for like half oh, and nice. half. And on Nantucket, in the bay there, there was a ton of wind coming in because there was a hurricane that was passing by. So there were people out there ripping it up. And then now on, on Martha's Vineyard, we saw people on, I think it's called Senge Packet Pond, saltwater pond, uh, where, where like the Jaws Bridge is. Mm -hmm. I've been yeah. There. Is that a good spot or? It is. I mean, Cape Cod and the islands here in Massachusetts are some of the best kiteboarding, most accessible kiteboarding in the world. Pretty warm water, consistent wind mix of waves and flat water and relatively easy to get to. Now, when I see those guys on YouTube that are riding somewhere that has like six foot waves and there's a ton of wind and they'll hit one of them and go like 50 feet up yep. in the air, like how dangerous is that? How hard is it? I mean, look, like any sport, you have people doing it at all kind of ranges of skill sets and safety levels and <laughs> levels of extremeness, I guess. If you go out on, <clears throat> on a moderate wind day, anyone can do it, right? But yeah, certainly if you get into tropical force winds with kites that are too large, you can really get some really big air. In fact, another great Boston startup company story is a company called Woo Sports that invented a device that you clip onto your kiteboard. No bunch of the guys have started it, really great guys. And 
you know, previously no one knew how high they were jumping. So, oh, I jumped 50 feet, I jumped 30 feet, I jumped 20 feet, but no one knew. But then they invented this device that you clip onto your board, you get back to the beach, Bluetooth connection to your cell phone, and it gives you a full readout of every jump you did, how high you went, how long you were in the air, and the G-force associated with the landing. And so now it actually pushed everyone because people realized, hey, we weren't jumping as high as we thought we were. You know, your first time you leave the water on a kiteboard, it feels like you're 20 feet in the air, but you're probably only two at most. And the Woo device made that abundantly clear to everybody. But it also gave you a way to progress because you could see your maximum jump heights and you could start to do better and better and better. And I think it not only was it really fun and a cool device and everyone posts what they did online and you can share different jump heights. In fact, another guy at at Cambridge Semantics, I think, holds the highest jump in Massachusetts or at this place called Pleasure Bay. It's something like 50 some feet. Holy cow. Yeah. They must have done that during a storm and probably about about 30 knots of wind. Yeah. Wow. And so. What are the kind of physics behind it? What are the movements? Like I grew up skateboarding and snowboarding and, you know, jumped off small yeah. cliffs and stuff doing that. Like, so I understand some of the physics, but with kiteboarding, like it seems like there's a kind of a wind up and then you're trying to get the kite to kind of pull you up as you're hitting the top Exactly. Of the it's a number of different things. I mean, ultimately it's about creating tension in the lines that releases combined with the motion of the kite. So a kite, when it's straight above your head, is what's called the neutral zone and it's not pulling you anywhere. When you dive it down into the wind, it creates pull, and that's what pulls you out of the water and you start to go. Now, if you have a lot of tension in the lines and the kite's pulling you forward, you can pull the kite back over your head, and that's what creates the lift up into the air. And you combine that motion with tension in the lines and release, releasing the edge of the board all at the right time, you can jump really high. In fact, jumping off of flat water is the easiest way to get a lot of air because it makes it easier to actually time the tension and the release point when you have less chop in the water. Now, if you certainly you time a jump hitting the lip of a wave, that can give you a bit of a boost. But the biggest jumps are typically all off of flat water. Really? So like that giant one, the record setter was off of flat yeah, water? Yeah, Sam's jump was in Pleasure Bay in South Boston, which is a really butterflat, special kiteboarding area, uh, very unique to Boston. And the guys like it because the wind comes over the break wall, but the water where they're actually riding is butterflat. Huh. So it makes it very, not easy, but predictable in terms of how you release the edge to make your jumps higher take some of the chop and white caps out of it exactly okay i would have figured that coming from a snowboarding background that the wave was the launch ramp and that you know that was a big factor yeah it can be and it's really fun to launch off of ramps but i think most kiteboarders would say that waves don't in general make you jump higher so how many lessons until you can get from standing on the beach with the thing over your head to semi-competent that's a good question. I think the biggest factor is having your lessons take place during good conditions. Not enough wind is the biggest challenge. You can get a feel for the kite, but if there's not enough wind that when you dive it, that it pulls you out of the water, then you're not going to have a really good time and you're going to struggle. But generally speaking, probably two to three, four hour lessons are enough to get sort of a reasonably good athlete, someone familiar with water and board sports to the point where they can then be self-sufficient, that they can, someone can launch the kite for them. They can go out and practice. And then you're probably, depending on how quickly you progress, anywhere from you know two days to two weeks of effort to get to the point where you can stay upwind. And that's kind of the holy grail. Once you can ride and stay upwind, then you can kind of kite anywhere and really progress faster. So is staying upwind kind of like tacking on a sailboat? Exactly. Yeah. On a sailboat, you can point upwind pretty effectively. With a kiteboard and heavy wind and the right kite, you can point up wind pretty well too, but you really need good wind and good control. I mean, the first time you get up and ride, oh, this is the best thing ever, but you're basically getting blown straight down wind because you're not edging properly or controlling the kite in the right fashion. Uh, but once you get that figured out, it's actually pretty easy to stay up wind. Huh, that's cool. Well, Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to you. Now I know a lot more about semantic technology and where to find the good powder. So uh, we appreciate you coming down and being on Underserved. And folks will look forward to following up and learning more in the show notes, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. All right. We'll talk to you again soon. Folks, if you're curious about kiteboarding or Cambridge semantics or any of the other topics we talked about, we will have links in our show notes for you to discover further. The show notes are the same place that the podcast is hosted. That is underserved.libsyn.com. Again, that's underserved.libsyn.com.
And we want to hear your feedback. Did you like the show? Do you want to hear something else? Are you interested in being a guest on a future show? In order to get in touch with us, you could use our email, underserved at syrinx.com. That's underserved at S-Y-R-I-N-X dot com.